Well, amen. Let me invite you to go ahead and take your Bible this morning and find the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians in chapter number one, we are introduced to the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. In fact, when we first meet him, he's called Saul. He is a Jew that hates the church. And Saul is doing everything he can to kill Christians, to kill the advancement of Christianity. And he's pretty productive. He's pretty effective. Until Saul encounters Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. Saul has this life-changing encounter with the resurrected Christ And it radically and dramatically changes his life in which Saul becomes Paul and Paul begins to, in fact, plant churches. He begins churches and he's starting churches over and over and over again and when he's not planting churches, he's writing letters to churches. He's he's strengthening churches, he's encouraging churches and other than Jesus himself, there's probably been a not another person that has impacted Christianity more than the Apostle Paul. What's extraordinary about his impact in Christianity is that he didn't begin as a teenager, but more midlife. And much of his ministry was done from a prison. Like many of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote from a prison cell. In fact, the letter that you and I are going to examine this morning was written from a prison cell. Paul loves the church. He loves the believers, and he's doing everything he can to encourage the church. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. He's writing to the Christians there, and he's saying, I'm in prison. I wish I could be with you. There are some things that I wish I could say to you in person. There are some things that I I want you to get. And because I can't be with you, I'm, I'm gonna write these things. In fact, I'm praying these things for you, and I want you to pray them. What you and I are going to do for the next couple of weeks is we're going to look at some of the prayers of Paul. In some of these letters that Paul wrote, he prayed. He was praying for the Christians, praying that they would get certain truths. And I think it's so very important for you and I to pray like Paul. So the first prayer that you and I are going to to examine together is found in Ephesians in chapter 1, beginning in verse number 15. If you're a guest today, what we normally do in the initial reading of God's Word, in honor and reverence of His Word, we stand together. I want to invite you to stand as I read aloud Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 15. You follow along. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can look at the screens. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 15, Paul says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Just as a a proud father, he's saying to the church, I'm so very proud of you. I I hear what is happening. I hear of your faith and of your growth and how you care and love for one another. And he says, "I'm, I'm praying for you. He begins to tell us in the next verse, in verse number 17, specifically exactly what he's praying. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom, and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And having the the eyes of your heart enlightened. You ought to underline that phrase. He prays that your, your, your eyes may be enlightened, that your eyes literally would be flooded with the knowledge of what? That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. 
And what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Before we're seated, I want us to pray that. I want us to pray that our eyes would be opened, that we would see today, this morning, that which God has for us. Would you bow your head for just a moment, and would you, would you pray that? Would you pray, Heavenly Father, open my eyes this morning. Open my eyes that I may see what you have for me. And Lord, that is our prayer. This very morning, in this very place, open our eyes, flood our eyes with the knowledge and understanding of that which you have for us today. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Take your pencil, take your pen, something that you can write with. I wanna ask two questions to begin. Number one, how many of you this morning believe that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Would you raise your hand? You believe that God has a plan, God has a purpose, God has his best for you. How many of you would also say that you believe there is an enemy, there is an adversary that is right now working against that plan for your life? There's an enemy. The apostle Paul knew that for those Christians, God had a plan, God had his best for them. But he also knew that there's an enemy that is working against that plan. And just as he was working against those believers in Ephesus, he is working against you. The Apostle Paul, because we learn from his writings, the Apostle Paul knew the primary strategies of the enemy as he's working against you and he's working against me. Number one is doubt. The enemy loves for us to doubt. It was his strategy in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning, in the garden. When he says to Eve, did God really say that if you eat of the tree, you would surely die? What did he do in the very beginning? He planted seeds of doubt. The devil loves to cause us to doubt the word of God, the promises of God, all that God has to offer to doubt. When he's not planting seeds of doubt, he's discouraging. I've said to you many times that the devil's number one tool in my life is discouragement. If he can't cause you to doubt, then he'll just discourage you in your Christian walk. If it's not doubt, if it's not discouragement, it's distraction. Can he distract you from the plan and purpose of God? I believe in today's culture, with social media, with our phones, with our busy schedules, the enemy distracts us from the main thing. If the enemy can cause you to doubt or be discouraged or maybe distracted, then what those things generally bring about in a family, in a church, is division. And if he can divide, he can conquer. The apostle Paul knew that these Christians who were growing in their faith and they had an understanding that God had his best for them, but there was an enemy working against it. Paul says, I wish I could be there. I wish there were some things that in person I could tell you to make sure that you got. But because I can't, I want you to know that I'm praying these things for you. And I think because Paul was praying those things, I think that he was wanting them to pray for those things. And I believe that Paul wants us to pray these things. I have no doubt in my mind with great boldness this morning to say to you, what God has placed on my heart, a burden, a passion, that in these days, in the life, in the season of our church, in my own life, that we, that I would pray like Paul. This morning, four truths, four things 
Paul wanted them to pray. Number one, Lord, that I may know your life-giving word. Lord, that I may know your life-giving word and that I would obey it. Look at verse number 17. Paul says that he's been praying. He's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul says, what I pray for you is that you would have spiritual wisdom and that you would have revelation when it comes to the knowledge of him. Now, what you and I have today, they didn't have. As a matter of fact, I can say with you with much confidence, you and I can have as much spiritual wisdom and as much revelation and the knowledge of him as we want. Because I want you to look up here. Everything you need, everything you need and everything you need to know about him is in this book. The book that you're holding in your lap right now this morning is everything you need to live the Christian life. And they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have this collection of letters that you and I have today. Sometimes we say something like this, well, I just wish I had an understanding of Jesus like this man. I just wish I had a faith. I just wish I had an understanding like Miss so-and-so. Well, friend, I want to say to you this morning, you can because that same Bible that I have is the Bible that you have, and you have just as much accessibility to it than I do. Everything you need to live the plan, the purpose, the wisdom, the revelation, the knowledge of the Lord, you have available. There's two things that God's given us, I believe, here in this church to help us have this knowledge, this spiritual wisdom, this revelation, this knowledge of him. One is this book. And my question for you is, are you reading it? Are you spending time in it? How much time do you spend on your phone? How much time are you spending watching television, binging on Netflix, and how much are you spending time in his word? Paul says, oh, I just wish you could get it. I just wish that you could get that you can have the revelation of the knowledge of him. You can gain in spiritual wisdom, and you and I have it. I've said this to you many times, and I want to encourage you this morning every single day. In fact, I believe that you begin your day with him in his word. When's the best time for the orchestra member? When's the best time to tune the instrument? Before the concert or after the concert? When's the best time for you to spend time in God's word? At the end of your day or before you begin your day? Friend, I want to begin my day in his word. And so I take my Bible, and I pray a very simple prayer. I say, Lord, I'm about to open your word. I'm about to read it, study it, meditate upon it, speak into my life. And then I open his word, and I begin where I left off the day before. Many of you do the lottery approach. You just kind of thumb through it. Lord, speak to me. I just believe in the systematic approach of Scripture. If I was in John chapter 15 yesterday, then I'm in John chapter 16 today. If I read verses 1 through 10 yesterday, then today I'm beginning in verse number 11. And I take out my journal, and the first thing that I do is I write a little W, Word of God. And I write down, what's the passage that I'm reading today? John chapter 16, 1 through 10. Write down that W, time in the word, W, and then you write the scripture. Then you write an O, I write the word O, the letter O, for observation. And then I begin to ask the Lord, Lord, show me what's happening in this context. Who is Jesus speaking to? Who is the Apostle Paul writing to? What's the context? What's the circumstance? And I begin to write down what is happening here. What is God teaching? What is God saying? 
and I'm making observation, and I write that down in my journal. God, speak to me, and I write it down. And then I write, a, I write the letter R, and I write down the word reflection. So now that I understand who Jesus was speaking to, who Paul was writing to, the context, the circumstance, now I begin to pray, Lord, how does this apply to me? Let me reflect this truth into my life. How does this word that's spoken 2,000 years ago, how do I apply it to my life? Lord, are you saying that I, I need to rest in you? Are you saying that I need to trust you with this situation? That I need to walk in wisdom? I begin to write down the reflection. What, what does this say to me? And then I write the letter D for discuss. Because now I'm going to discuss this with God. If God has spoken to me that morning about wisdom, about patience, about peace, whatever it may be, then I'm now going to discuss that with my Heavenly Father. Lord, I have heard from you today. Thank you for speaking into my life. And God, I'm asking that you take this truth and you work it in and through my life today. So I spend some time discussing it with God, but then for the rest of the day, I'm looking for an opportunity to discuss it with someone else. If Neil and I, for example, go to lunch, I'm looking for that opportunity at lunch for me to say, you know what, Neil, this very morning the Lord was speaking to me in his word, and this is what he taught me. See, for those of you that are educators here, you know that if you can actually share something that you've learned, you're more apt to keep it. It's more apt to be a part of who you are. And so every single day, let me encourage you to spend time in the Word, W-O-R-D. God has given, as Paul's praying, there's some things that I want you to, to make sure you get. I want you to have spiritual wisdom. I want you to have revelation and the knowledge of him and who he is. And I would say to you that we have that, number one, in this book every single day. We also have it in which we can gain spiritual wisdom and our knowledge of him in something we call here groups, life groups. See, there's, there's only so much that you can know and you can learn by yourself. As a matter of fact, you only know what you know. But when you are in a group, you're able to learn from the lives of others. The beautiful thing about life groups here at Cottage Hill is that we actually learn and we grow and we gain spiritual wisdom and our knowledge of him by and through the lives of others. How many of you are in a life group? Would you raise your hand? You would say, Pastor, I'm in a life group. How many of you that are in a life group would say that a part of your faith journey, that your life group has been a pivotal part of your journey? Would you raise your hand? You see, you can only know what you know. But when you are in a group, you learn from the lives of others. And you in a group can learn even more than what Pastor Allen can teach you on a Sunday morning. And so Paul says, here's how I'm praying for you. And if you and I are gonna pray like Paul, we're gonna pray, Lord, that I may know your life-giving word. Number two, Lord, that I may know my life-changing hope. That I may know my life-changing hope. Look at verse number 18. What does Paul say? Paul says, I'm praying that the, the, the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened. Enlightened to what? That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. You ought to underline that word hope. We talked a little bit about it last week. You see, Bible hope is different than our hope. Often when we use the word hope, it's almost in like using the word wish. You know, I, I hope I get to play golf on Friday. I hope it doesn't rain. I'm about to have an appointment across the bay. I hope there's not much traffic. 
We use the word hope as if, as if it's a wish. But when you read about hope in the Bible, it's much more than a wish. As a matter of fact, hope in the New Testament, it means a confident expectation and assurance in the promises of God. That's what hope is when you read it in the New Testament. A confident expectation, not a wish, but a confident expectation and an assurance in the promises of God. Paul says, here's how I pray for you. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be flooded with the understanding of the hope that you have in his calling. Now, where does this kind of confident expectation and assurance, where does this hope come from? Well, he says here, hope in his calling. In other words, the hope that is referenced here in Paul's letter comes from your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where the hope is. The hope comes from your relationship with Jesus. And Paul was writing to a people. He was writing to a culture that had no hope. As a matter of fact, here in Ephesians in chapter 2 and verse number 12, it says this, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He's writing to a people, that first century Roman world were a people that had no hope. There was an adage that the, the common Roman citizen would use and that it's really best for you not even to be born at all. And if you were born, that you would just die soon after birth. He's writing to a people that just had no hope. Paul's writing to a church. He's writing to Christians who knew that there would be times in their life that would be so dark and so discouraging that they would have a sense of hopelessness. And he says, I want you to pray the way I'm praying for you, that your eyes would be flooded with the light of the hope that you have in your calling in Christ Jesus. We talked a little bit about it last week. My favorite verse in all the Bible when it comes to hope is found in the book of Hebrews in chapter 6 and verse number 19. Let's look at it again. And we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, that our hope, the hope that we have in our relationship with Jesus. Friend, I'm telling you, no Jesus, no hope. But if you have Jesus and a relationship with him, you have hope that is an anchor for the soul. Just as a ship's anchor goes down, down, down into the depths of the oceans, our hope goes up, up, up into the heavenlies, into the holy of holies, behind the curtain where the Lord Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where my hope is. It's a sure and steadfast anchor. So that regardless of what happens in this life, what happens to me, friend, my, sh my future is sure and steadfast because my soul is anchored in the heavenlies. But can I say to you this morning, my hope is not just in my eternal security, but friend, my hope gives me peace and joy right here, right now. Write this down. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in what? Say it. Hope. So I have this hope in my relationship with Jesus. It is an anchor for my soul. It is a confident expectation and assurance in the promises of God that when I die, I know I'm going to heaven because my, my, I'm already anchored there. But not just there, but here and now. Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, the God of hope placed his spirit in me. I can be filled, what did he say? With joy and peace. In the here and now, joy and peace here and now. Hope is the 
the confident expectation and assurance in the promises of God. Can I give you a couple of promises very, very quickly to encourage you, the hope that you have? Write this down, Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one, verse number six, and I am confident of this, Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, you are still under construction, amen? As long as you have breath in your body, God is still working in your life. Hey, listen, it may be dark for you right now. You may be discouraged. You may be distracted. You may even feel hopeless. But listen, God is at work in you. Paul says, I am sure of this. I am confident of this, that he who began that work in you will bring it to completion. Have hope. He's not done with you. Can I give you one more promise? Romans chapter eight, verse number 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, not everything that happens to you is good, but what he promises is that if you'll trust in him, he will bring good out of it. Paul says, I want you to know I want your eyes to be enlightened. I need you to pray. I need you to pray that you would know that the life-giving hope that you have in him. There's a third thing that he wants us to pray. Lord, that I may know my tremendous worth. Lord, that I may know my tremendous worth. He goes on to say in verse number 18, as he's praying that their eyes would be enlightened to what? And what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So often when we read in the New Testament about the inheritance, our inheritance, we think about what we receive when we die, right? Because now we've been born again We're sons and daughters of God. We're children of God. And when we die, we get our inheritance. As a matter of fact, a little bit earlier in this chapter, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 14, it says this about the guarantee. He's talking about the Holy Spirit in verse 14. And he says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? In other words, when you were born again, you know what God did? God placed in you his spirit as a guarantee that when you died, you'd get your inheritance. It's the same word that's used to describe earnest or earnest money. If you were to purchase a house and you are determined that you're going to buy it, you put down what? A down payment. You put down some earnest money. You put down some, a guarantee that the contract would be fulfilled. God says, I placed in you my spirit as a guarantee that one day you'll get your inheritance. Here's the thing. This isn't what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about our inheritance. He's actually talking about his inheritance. Look back at the verse, the latter part of verse number 18. What does he say? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance? Look up here. There are some of you who are living the Christian life going about 35 miles an hour. And God is wanting you to max it out because you have believed the lie of the enemy. You have a sense of worthlessness about you. You think that your life doesn't count, your life doesn't matter. Paul says, I need you to know, I need you not to believe or listen to the enemy. Your life matters. You matter. You are valuable. As a matter of fact, the Lord himself sees you as his inheritance. That's how valuable you are. When I was in seminary, I was doing everything I could to live the Christian life and perform for the Lord. I encountered a pastor one time and he was meeting with me. He said, Alan, let me ask you a question. If you are sitting right now, your chair, sitting in front of the Lord Jesus, toe to toe, knee to knee, eye to eye, what do you think Jesus would say to you? I said, if we were toe to toe, knee to knee, eye to eye, and Jesus is in front of me, I believe that Jesus would say to me, Alan, I tolerate you. 
Because I know how I fail him. There's not a day that goes by that I don't fail him. Alan, I'm disappointed in you. Do you know what my pastor friend said? Alan, he wouldn't say that. Do you know what he would say to you? Toe to toe, knee to knee, eye to eye. I love you. And you are valuable to me. You are my inheritance. Paul says that, you would, that your eyes would be flooded with the understanding that, that you are the riches of his inheritance. When Christopher was about five years old, he, he fell, he cut himself, and we had to take him, and they had to put some stitches, and Kathy and I were talking about this last night, and she had Connor, he was small, and, and they said, he's going to need stitches, and, and Kathy says, okay, now, Alan, you take him back, I, I can't handle this, and she waited in the waiting room, and I took him to the back, and, and here's what the doctor said, the doctor says, I need you to put your arms around him, I need you to hold him, don't let him move. Because we've got to put some shots in, and then we've got to put some stitches in. And I'm going to tell you about my boy. I had to hold him. And he cried, and he said, don't, Daddy, don't let him. Don't let him, Daddy. And if I could have somehow said, Doctor, give me the stitches. Give me, d- d- g- if he needs five, give me ten. It hurt me to watch my boy hurt. The Bible says that God demonstrated his own love for you and that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Listen, God watched his son spit on, beaten, whipped, nails driven in his hands and feet. He watched this. He watched his boy because he loves you. A few weeks ago, I was to do a funeral and I I called the, the, the gentleman I was to do the funeral for his dad, and he said, hey, hey, Alan, just come over to my dad's house. My sister and I will meet you there, and we'll talk about the service. And I, I drove over, and I went in the house, and it looked like, a, like, like tape had gone off. There was, there was painter's tape, little pieces of painter's tape all over different pieces of furniture and items in the house, and little pieces of yellow tape. It looked like a yellow tape and a blue tape bomb went off in the house. And I just kind of looked around, and and uh, I said, what, what's going on? He goes, well, this is, this is our dad's things. He said, this is what he said. He said, this is our inheritance. And he goes, I've taken the blue tape and my sister's taken the yellow tape and we're marking the things that we want. He says, I want all of it. But I'm picking the things that I, that I really want because I can't have all of it. I'll never forget that visit because what I'm saying to you this morning is this. Long before you ever thought of him, the Lord marked you as his own, as his inheritance. You were marked as his precious and valuable inheritance. Don't ever question your value, your worth, because he paid it all for you. Paul says that your eyes may be enlightened And then lastly, he says, Lord, that I may know your incredible power. We're we're out of time, and so very quickly. Notice the last verse there, verse number 19. He says, "And, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Paul's talking about the power that is available to you and me. He says, I don't want you to miss it. I need to make sure you get this. Look back at the verse, and there's some words that I want you to underline. In fact, there's four words that he uses to describe this power that is available to you and to me. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Underline that word power in your Bible. It's the word dunamis. It's where we get our word dynamite, an explosive force of power. The better translation is is like a dynamo, an ongoing power that never ceases, never ends. That's what Paul says. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working? Underline that word working. It's the Greek word energia. It's where we get our word energy. It's an operating power. 
How, do, how, how can you do that which God's called you to do? He gives you the energy. He gives you the operating power that's working of his great might. Underline that word might. It means a force of power. A force of power. And then underline the word great. It means ultimate. Paul says that your eyes would be flooded with the light and the understanding of the power that is available in you. What kind of power? What kind of power? Let's look at the next verse, verse number 20, and we're done. Verse number 20. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. What kind of power does Paul want to make sure that you understand that you have? It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's available to you. The same power that not only raised him up, but ascended and placed him at the right hand of the Father. That same power is available to you and to me by way of his spirit. Now here's what you're asking. Here's what you're wondering. Well, Alan, you mean I have that power? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Well, if I have it, why don't I have it? I mean, if I have it, how come I don't have it? Listen carefully. What does it say? The same power raised him from the dead, placed him at the right hand of the Father, where he rules and reigns as the Lord of this universe at this very moment. Amen? Here's what you and I would never question, never doubt. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. But the real question is, do you acknowledge his lordship? Here's the truth. Here's the key. Here's the key to the power. God's power flows in you when Jesus is Lord in you. His power flows in you when he is Lord in you. Would you bow your head with me for a moment? I want to pray for us. Worship team is going to come. I'm going to ask our pastors to come stand here at the front. There are some of you here this morning, you've yet to take that first step of faith. The turning from your sin and your selfishness and trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that's the step of obedience you need to take this very morning. It's a courageous step. It's a step into the unknown because this is new to you. You're not even sure what to do next. What I'm praying for this morning is you would have just enough courage to step out and come to one of these pastors. And I assure you, we'll help you with the rest. There are others of you who have been listening to and believing the lies of the enemy. It may be about hope. You feel hopeless. It may be about your value, about your worth. You feel like that your life doesn't matter, your life doesn't count, and that you're worthless. and that you have no power. Friend, these are lies, lies of the enemy. Paul says, I pray for you. I pray that you would have spiritual wisdom and you would grow in the knowledge of him, that which you would, <laughs> you would know the hope that you have in him the joy and peace that is available from the God of hope who's placed his spirit inside you. And that your life matters. Your life counts. That you would know the riches of his 
glorious inheritance. That's what you are. And there is this immeasurable power that is working in you, that is available. Lord, open our eyes that we may see. I'm gonna pray for us. We're gonna worship together. The altar is open. These pastors are here. If you're watching online, I want to encourage you. Text the word connect. Let us help you. Let us call you, let us email you, let us help you. If there's a word that I would say to you today, it is this, there is more. There is more that God has for you, there is more. And so Lord, I pray as Paul prayed that across this room, those that are watching, that our eyes would be opened to the riches of his inheritance, of our worth, of our value, of the hope that we have in you, the power, the strength, the might that is available, that there is no addiction, there is no stronghold that cannot be broken. There is no obstacle too difficult. There is no mountain too high. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to bow before you, acknowledging your Lordship today in this place. Perhaps literally and physically on our knees, you are Lord. Rule and reign in my life. Release in me hope and joy and peace and power and might. Lord, I want more. I want more. I want more. More of you. In Jesus' name.